Hello everybody. My name is Felicity Freeman and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sheffield. My research is primarily on the use of closed loop control to achieve an improvement in mechanical properties in directed energy deposition. And I'm here to talk to you today about the powder characteristics conducive to successful directed energy deposition builds and how they differ from the characteristics that are relevant for laser powder bed fusion. I'd like to start by considering the DED process uh, in its sense. So the schematic here is the powder delivery system in the directed energy deposition process. There are many different configurations of machines available from different manufacturers. So I've tried to keep this quite generic, um, but I'm primarily going to consider the powder delivery system in the Beam Magic 800, which is the system that we have at Sheffield. The DED process uh, uses um, hoppers to hold and store the powders that we use. And these powders are then introduced into um, an argon stream. That argon and powder mixed stream then travels through some fairly convoluted pipework until it reaches the nozzle and it then exits the nozzle, interacts with the laser and is incorporated into the melt track. So considering each of these aspects in turn, starting with the hoppers. So the hoppers I'm describing here are the ones that we have on our process, but different hopper configurations and approaches are made by different manufacturers. Our hoppers store between three to five kilograms of powder, and we use them for steel, nickel, and titanium powders. And we use a size range of 45 to 105 microns. The hoppers are gravity fed, and there is a restriction at the base of the container section, which is designed to reduce the effect of the pressure head on the rate of powder flowing out of the bottom of that container section. There is then also a stirrer right at the base where the powder exits onto a turntable. When the powder flows onto a turntable, it passes through a polymer scraper, which is shown in white in the bottom right hand corner. That scraper has a channel cut out of the bottom, which determines the size of the powder track in terms of its width and depth. The track size multiplied by the rotation speed then gives you a flow rate. So this approach gives you a volumetric control. Uh, we require a mass flow rate for the process. So we do offline measurements, running the hopper for between one and two minutes and measure the mass that comes through in that time and then adjust the turntable speed accordingly. Looking at the of the powder through this part of the process. So we've tested our process using both gas and water atomized stainless steel powders, uh, 316 uh, steel. They were both delivered to us in a 45 to 105 micron size range. Um, the gas atomized powder and water, it, atomized powder were both analysed by SEM and also for their shape characteristics. So the SEM images are shown in the top left corner there. You can see the gas atomised on the left, much more, uh, obviously much more spherical than the water atomised, which has a very crenellated appearance. The graphs just below show the distribution of sphericity and aspect ratio for gas and water correspondingly. So we can see the uh, characteristics for the gas atomized on the left, both up at around 0.8 to 0.9 for both sphericity and aspect ratio, while the water atomized powder shows a much wider range, um, but also shows values down at around, I think, down to about 0.4 for both sphericity and aspect ratio. And that's what we'd expect from looking at those SEM images. When we then looked at them in the hopper, we see the behavior shown in the graph at the bottom. 
So this shows our turntable speed on the x-axis and the mass flow rate that we achieved on the y-axis. And for this process, we were aiming for a flow rate of seven grams a minute. So the red line you can see there is the behavior we got with the gas atomized powder using what I've referred to here as a low volume scraper. So this was a scraper with um, a fairly narrow channel that was not particularly deep. And in order to achieve our mass flow rate, uh, we needed a turntable speed of about 1.4 RPM. When we used that same scraper with the water atomized powders, we saw a much lower flow rate for the same turntable speed. Uh, so in this instance, to achieve our target flow rate, we needed around 4 RPM. When we modified the hopper configuration to use a higher volume scraper, so this is one which deposited a much deeper track, um, we were able to obviously reduce the turntable speed and we then achieved our target flow rate with a turntable speed of about 0.8 RPM. Both of those were perfectly acceptable. They were just slightly different behaviors. Of the two, we decided to go with the uh, slower turntable speed with the higher volume scraper, as this was felt to be less at risk of uh, blockage um, under the scraper. What we achieved when we then built with these is we got perfectly good build quality using either powder. Uh, they were very comparable in the ways that they built and the um, the, the quality of the, the samples we produced with them. The only difference we saw really was that the water atomized powder had a higher oxygen level, as you'd expect from its manufacturing process. So we could say from this that both sericity and aspect ratio um, didn't really seem to have an effect on our process as tested at this point. Moving on to the pipework then. Uh, so the system we have has around 12 meters of pipework running from the hopper exit to the nozzle. And there are significant lengths of that which are vertical pipe with upwards flow, which from a, a transport perspective is not ideal. When we look at the flow through this pipework then, we have six liters a minute of carrier gas, in this case argon, flowing through this pipework. And our powder flow rate is only seven grams a minute, which means that when we look at the powder as a proportion of the gas stream, uh, it's only 0.015% by volume. So we have very few particle to particle interactions once the powder has left the hopper. We have bulk behavior in the hopper, but as soon as it exits the hopper, it's not behaving as a bulk product any longer. What we are aware of is that through the pipework, small particles will travel much faster than large, and that large particles also have a risk of saltation where the flow rate is insufficient to keep them moving on these vertical sections and they will drop to the bottom. Uh, there is then the possibility that they may actually block the pipework. So from my perspective, the characteristic I think is interesting at this stage of the process is particle size distribution. And more specifically, whether we see segregation as we move through the process. So whether our large particles actually make it through to the nozzle at, in the same proportion that they were at the start. And so sampling as a raw powder at the exit of the hopper and at the exit of the nozzle and looking for whether we see just differences as we go through, whether we are segregating by our transport approach. To the nozzle. So the nozzle we have has three gas streams. We've got essential gas, which is coincident with the laser. We've got our carrier gas, which is mixed in with our powder. And we then also have a secondary shaping gas flow. The beam system is unusual in this respect. Most systems uh, only have the central gas and the carrier gas. A further aspect of our nozzle is that we have uh, concentric streams of these three gas flows. 
uh, some of the systems you see, and I believe this is more common in America, is to have uh, individual jets of powder, either three or four jets sitting around uh, in a symmetrical arrangement. When we look then at how particles exit the nozzle and incorporate themselves into the melt pool, these different arrangements become quite important. So the imaging you can see at the bottom there is of um, a line laser that was uh, put at the side of the nozzle to interact with the gas flow um, with the powder coming out. So regions shown in red are where there was a high density of powder particles interacting with that line laser. What we can see within this is that our powder stream in this instance was not symmetrical. Um, so the powder was more heavily concentrated on the right hand side of the powder stream. When we consider things like particle size distribution and surface area to volume ratio, that then becomes quite important because when we say, well, small particles travel faster, there's the possibility that they may travel so fast that they go straight through this focal point and just get dispersed. So we uh, need to look at whether our particle size distribution as observed by the melt pool is then representative of what we had at the start. Again, with surface area to volume ratio, when we think back to the picture of the water atomized powder versus the gas atomized powder, the water atomized powder has a much larger surface compared to its volume. So potentially those particles will travel faster because they're interacting with the gas flow much more significantly. The next aspect that I think is really important and is something I'm not seeing people looking at at the moment is about how those particles then interact with the laser as they're traveling and whether they arrive at the melt pool solid or liquid. Part of this is potentially um, driven by the speed of their travel and the working distance. So different machines require a different offset between the nozzle and the melt pool. Uh, part of it is around the heat transfer characteristics. So if uh, looking at the heat transfer between the laser and the solid particle versus the characteristics between the liquid melt pool and the solid particle. Part of this is around the surface oxidation, the chemistry of the powder particles. Um, me metal oxides have a higher absorptivity than the parent metal. So a more heavily oxidized surface, something like that water atomized powder, will probably absorb more of the laser energy while it's in transit. So there's the potential then for one chemistry of powder to have melted in transit, while a different chemistry of powder is still solid when it arrives. Again, surface area to volume ratio. And then finally, a question around buoyancy. So if particles arrive at the melt pool solid and are dragged down to the bottom and stay there, then you've only got a liquid to solid interface for heat transfer. If those particles bob back up to the top, either through Marangoni flow or their own buoyancy, they're then at the surface and are potentially interacting with the laser again, as well as interacting with the melt pool. So there's an awful lot going on there, but it's all around the individual particle and the effective absorptivity that the whole process observes. So in what are we looking at? Directed energy deposition is a very different process from laser powder bed fusion. The bulk behavior, the things we normally measure, those are really just limited to the behavior in the hopper. And for many systems, we can manage flow rate through changing the hopper setup. Um, and we've seen that cheaper, less spherical powders can give good flow rate behavior. So where are the characteristics that really make or break the process? I see those being much more around how the powder incorporates itself into the melt pool. And bulk characterization methods don't help us there. We're, we really need to understand how we characterize individual particle absorptivity, individual particle behaviors, and those were uh, where we're gonna make or break 
are DED processed. So that was my presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention.